right, everybody. Uh, welcome to this development update. Today would be, I guess it's St. Patrick's Day, because the kids just came in. Like, all four of them just... <laughs> I got lots of pitches. Didn't know. But I guess we all now know. Oh, well, you guys probably already knew. But today's March 17th, uh, 2023. This is the weekly recap development update. Um, may switch back to Thursdays. It seems like there's less turnout on Fridays. I think everybody's out partying, but I, I like it because it's a nice recap for the rest of the week. I get more code done. It kind of, the break on the day Thursday kind of, I don't know. I, I don't get a full day of code in on Thursday if I, if I do it. So I kind of like doing it on Friday, but if you guys have any suggested alternative dates, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Just feel free to respond to this tweet. Leave a comment of any any sort if you if you think there's a better day to do it. But Friday has seemed to work. I guess it just really depends on when the, the week starts. Um, so Thursday could start on Sunday and get the same effect. But either way, so we we released the public beta of the mobile wallet last Friday, and we've essentially been going through logs and bug reports this week. Um, Kendall is just wrapping up some stuff for his bugs. There are some UI bugs. I ran into one or two more backend bugs, fixed those. And then, well, I've been at it. I've been just cleaning up a lot of the code, running thread sanitizers, memory sanitizers, all of that. Um, I found a couple lock order inversions, cleared all that out. Um, so it's running really nice and smooth now, which is good. Um, I mean, it was already running smooth before, but I don't know. I just, I feel it when things, when things feel better in the program. It's, I don't know, a weird sense of some kind. Uh, but it, it, it's definitely the, the lock order inversions were, were very old. And that, that could potentially, what happens is that could potentially cause a deadlock. Um, if you have a mutex that gets locked while it's waiting for another mutex to unlock, then they both get stuck waiting. And so the result of that is like your, your API will stop responding to some requests or whatever. But it, it doesn't happen. But there's been like one instance that's been happening on Beth that we've been trying to track it down. And we read the red sanitizer on his server. And we weren't able to actually get a lock order inversion, but I think that should be fixed now. Which that's that's one of those really dirty, hard to dig out bugs. And AU developers, you'll you'll understand that. Um, <laughs> it just depends. Some of them take like a month to come out. Sometimes it takes two weeks of beating it up to even get the bug to happen, and then you just gotta hope that you have <laughs> enough debug info when it happens to be able to determine what happened. Otherwise, you gotta wait and do it all over again. But Regardless, um, a lot of the the main core bugs are, are pretty well are pretty well solved now. Um, Kendall's working on some UI stuff. I think we're going to do some UI enhancements, not for this next release, but um, this is kind of like probably one or two cycles, I'd say, from being close to final release. Because this next cycle is really just wrapping up a lot of the bug fixes that we had from the prior round, and um, not really adding any features just to, to make sure everything's solid but uh, I have some requests like I think it would be nice when you click on your account um, you get account info for there to be the transaction history for that account right below that so it feels even more like an online bank because when you when you have a bank account you can click on each one of your accounts and see the transaction history for both and then obviously your main transactions page would be for the transaction history for all of the accounts but I think seeing it on a per account basis rather than a six chain basis would be um, I don't know, I, it would feel a lot smoother for me. Um, we have some other, you know, suggestions, um, which, you know, if you guys have suggestions, you can drop them in the comments as far as, like, improving the visual appearance. There was, there was some requests. I don't know if this is going to go in the course, so don't set this as an expectation, but there were some requests to have a globe on there like we have on the desktop wallet, which might be doable. I don't know. We're, we just don't expect any UI tweaks, okay, for this next release. We're just this, this last round has just been pure debug, right? But we got a while, like, as far as we're releasing the desktop wallet and then we have the hard fork and all that to get this, this mobile wallet to be submitted to the app store. So there is a window of time. I'm suspecting maybe one more cycle of a, bug bugs you know this this first one i think we got a lot of them but there may be some more but i want to add a couple enhancements on the back end as far as right currently um if you you've used nexus obviously you have um you essentially when you send a transaction you have to wait for one confirmation before you're able to credit it and you don't always see that incoming balance immediately on the mobile wallet you do in the desktop wallet because you see it in the memory pool 
and it comes as a potential event to you. But I want to make that zero confirmation balance um, visible to, to the end users as soon as you essentially receive a debit and it, it hits your phone, then you'll know and you'll get a notification. So that uh, I think that's going to be really important for merchants, for anyone. You know, confidence is really in speed. Something happens, and when there's time between when you click a button and something's not happening, then that lets the mind wander. So we want to reduce that window as much as possible, which means as soon as somebody fires off the transaction, you see the debit, even though it may take a couple minutes or one minute or even 20 seconds, depending on the blocks, for that to be issued into a credit, it still indicates that the funds were sent and you can verify the contract and all of that stuff. And so that adds a lot of really cool merchant services. So you know, the the blue skies of this mobile wallet, this is just kind of your, your regular end user mode. But eventually we, we would like to see point of sale mode and um, uh, maybe not, uh, obviously not immediately, but in the longer term uh, to, to essentially build a, a really useful merchants app. Um, if you can track inventory and everything, a lot of that happens directly through your point of sale already, and people use Square and stuff like that. But you know, a, a lot of what I'm noticing, uh, you know, point of sale devices now are really using iPads of some kind, right? And Square attached with you know iPad. So adding a Nexus wallet on there um, isn't too much extra hassle, and I think that would be really, really powerful for people to have that same experience and almost you know a very similar interface. Um, of using Square or any other, you know, merchant services so that you'd have, you know, additional, you know, risk monitors and stuff like that. You know, you'd be able to see if there's any red flags going off in the cryptocurrency, such as, you know, if somebody issues a, a conflicted transaction as soon as they send that transaction, that's in indicative of somebody attempting to double spend. The conflict resolution in the memory pool will handle that, and it's actually pretty difficult to even force a conflict through, and it becomes immediately known to the merchant, right? But so, you know, this is the first the first consumer version of it, but, you know, ideally uh, in the future, it's it, it's going to really grow into a really awesome, useful app, um, you know, for emergent services so that as people are getting more people to accept Nexus, um, you're not just, you know, having a Nexus wallet on you. You can actually start to really manage and, you know, create receipts or whatever else. I think that would be a really useful tool. And then tying, you know, inventory in, you know, you can essentially fire up your own little private network in your, uh, you know, store, you know, between a computer and an iPad and a couple other things and create your own inventory system on your own little private network, right? You know, basic things like that, because uh, you definitely would want inventory for your store held in a private network. There's no point in putting it in the public. And it, you, you want to have, you know, quantities of how much you have, like not necessarily something uh, fully visible to everybody. But, or maybe you do. It's it's all up to you, but it, it just costs a little bit more money to put an asset on the chain and the public chain just for security reasons. And we also don't want people to do name squatting and just you know you, you, people don't value things that they they get for free, right? So we've we've made our fee model a little bit higher, just you know part of that psychological, just to make sure that what you do put on Nexus, you know, is going to be something that's worth it to you. But anyway, so that's that's Merchant. Um, that's just kind of a little bit of a blue sky, so you can kind of see where we're going with this mobile wallet. Um, it could end up being another standalone app. Not exactly sure architecturally how that'll go, or it could be something in the same app. It might make sense to just have a separate um, shopping app, you know, and then tie that with inventory and then e-commerce, smart contracts, you know, all the stuff. Like you can really start to create a really powerful toolkit um, for you know anybody running a store or whatever else. So. That's the mobile wallet. Basically, we're um, planning on a next version, the next iteration. This would be release candidate seven, I believe, or six um, for the core. Um, Kendall is wrapping up some stuff today, tomorrow. So we're planning on uh, having that go public on Monday. If you are involved in any of the private testing groups, we can get you binaries before then. Um, just shoot, you know, Kendall a message for either the, the Android or the iOS if you if you've already signed up for test flight and stuff like that. That actually should go to you before it goes public if you're already um, in that group of testers. But that's looking pretty good. We're 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 pretty much that's that's going out on Monday. Um, and another thing's going out on Monday, uh, the desktop wallet. So I, I also during this last week fixed the last remaining bugs that we were having in the desktop wallet. So now, um, 
that's coming out too on Monday. So you guys get two things on Monday. You get a new beta wallet um, for the desktop and a new uh, beta for the, the mobile. And they're both going to be public betas. So this is going to be, you know, Christo says that it's pretty well ready to wrap as far as the desktop wallet. So <laughs> there may be some cosmetic things here and there, things that you guys need to have adjusted. Um, maybe there's feature requests, things like that. You know, just this is this is the time to be, you know, I guess giving your feedback. This is the time when it's mutable, we're changing, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a good time to give feedback, right? I mean, but just be conscious of your feedback. You know, if you, if you say, like, you need to redesign the whole thing, I mean, that's obviously not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, reasonable, you know, tweaks, essentially, like the globe. You know, that, that was a really cool idea. And uh, I don't see how it would be too big of a problem, but I, I can't guarantee that because we need to talk to the other developers about that. So... Yeah, it's the mobile wallet and the desktop wallet. They're both pretty much ready to go. We're giving ourselves just a little extra time. Um, so if you're, you know, a private tester or whatever, um, like I said, you can you can get binaries beforehand. But the, the links will be go public on Monday. I'll post a tweet about it with the links to the the new mobile and uh, the new desktop. If if you already know the links, it that it's going to be the same link copied for the desktop or for the sorry the android and ios mobiles it's the same link uh, just for future references well anytime there's a new version it'll always be accessible on the same link either through test flight on ios or the android play store um, for the, the android so that feels good that that feels good so we got two things coming out the door on monday which i'm it's been getting it out of the lab is usually the, the most difficult part because there's always more to do right it's never done <laughs> if anybody's an artist and understands what I'm saying. It's never done. You, you know exactly what I'm saying. So you have to know when and where to, to cut off some of the features. And so, but either way, I'm glad that we uh, did the long haul and did it because it, as I've been going through the documentation and everything, it really, like, it, it really is an amazing piece of machinery just to see all of the, the different functionalities. And it's going to be really cool to see what people do with it. And, you know, it's, it's really powerful. It really is, like with the queries and the filters and the operators, and, and I even created a, a function in the, the query so you can actually call a function to derive, like do a reverse lookup, or you can do a PTR lookup, or you can do a date resolution so you don't have to type in the Unix timestamp and derive that. It can just convert a date string into a, a Unix timestamp. So, I mean, it really has, like, the, so you guys know that SQL, Structured Query Languages, it's, it's a database semantic that's essentially a database query language. So it's the, the language now has the power in the API to query everything like it's a MySQL database. Um, it's really powerful. And not only just that, but like, you know, through those, those, those queries and you can filter it and put it down so you can do statistical analysis on your transaction history, for instance. Um, you know, you just add a simple where query between two date ranges and then you filter by balance and then do a sum or standard deviation or whatever you really want to do. And now you, you have all this power at your fingertips. And on the front end, as a developer, you don't have to worry about dealing with all that stuff. And honestly, front end abstracted code shouldn't be doing that type of stuff, like calculating and caching and stuff, because it's just, it's a higher level language. It's got more going on to get it to do the same thing as something in C or C++. Um, Nexus is just pure low level C++. It's fast. It's just one of the faster languages. It's just, it's really fast. So it should do as much as possible. And then that kind of gives you the additional benefit of as an application developer, you don't have to worry about <laughs> managing all of these things that are complicated, like the authentication system. That is a huge hurdle. If you've ever developed a web application, you know, done remote login, you know, handling encryption, managing encryption, making sure files are secured. I mean, that's another big problem. Like where do you store the keys to keep them safe from being hacked, but still accessible when you need them, right? Um, the, those are major architectural issues that everybody that deals with security in a web app is going to run into. So usually you bridge that um, through services, right? Like the typical authentication system people use is OAuth, Google's authentication, or they just say log in with Facebook or whatever, right? But if you want to use OAuth on your app, I think it's like a dollar per user, right? But it's worth the cost because building a secure authentication system is no easy feat. And you don't know what you don't know, but you don't know that you messed up until somebody hacked your site. <laughs> and everybody's afraid of that happening. So people naturally go to the things that they know that they know, which, well, I know Google and OAuth works, so I'm going to pay the dollar a user. Well, you know, now we're going to steal that market share because why are you going to do that when you can just fire up Nexus and now 
you know, it's better for the end user too, because you don't have to manage all the passwords. I mean, I'm, 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 a, <laughs> I'm a reasonably intelligent person and I don't like to manage all my passwords because this one says you can't have three letters and this one, you can't have three numbers and it just gets ridiculous. So, you know, handling password managers in that way is really cool. Um, I've also been dabbling with an idea of, of developing like a password manager on chain too, where you can actually encrypt some of your passwords that are relevant to other sites in an object register so that by logging into your SIG chain, you then generate the decryption key that allows you to, to load any of those passwords. So you could actually use it for a password manager for external services that aren't necessarily logging with Nexus as well. Um, I may add that to the crypto API or something. So you could, that actually might be a good feature to add to it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Okay. But anyhow, so now feature build out, uh, 5152, all of that. So I gave you the front end mobile, the mobile and the desktop wallet. Those, the you know, next round of, well, the first round of public betas is going out Monday for the desktop wallet and the first round of mobile, or the next round of public mobile running 501RC6 will be going out Monday as well as far as the leaks will become available. So that's exciting. I'm really excited that we, we've gotten to that milestone. It's been <laughs> it's been a long haul. We all know. We've all been here. Now you, you, you think waiting was hard. Try waiting and coding at the same time. It's just <laughs> yeah, it's twice as hard. But we got here. We're here. Right. So that's good. That's pretty much a wrap. It's just going to be kind of mild debugging along the way. Um, you know, submit issues, go through logs, fix bugs, um, but not anything really. You know super crazy as far as time. So I've been shifting gears back into 5.152. So I've been working on the reverse tunneling router now, which is the, the RTR, which is a Lisp terminology. If anybody remembers Dino Farinacci, wonderful, amazing engineer. Really, I'm grateful to have had you know him as a mentor for as long as I did. He taught me a lot. So you know that's what I'm calling it an RTR for the sake of Lisp, because I love Lisp. It's, it's a really brilliant brilliant network architecture and it really laid the foundation for the one stack the open nexus open nexus execution stack and really with that dino i would not have learned what was wrong with the internet to even be able to conceive ideas that could fix it potentially and not i'm not just talking about the, the governance issues but the actual architectural issues such as border gate protocol and how the osi works and you know, address resolution packets and everything. It's just, it's just a completely unauthenticated stack that, you know, and it's really, it was really valuable to be able to learn from someone like him who, who actually worked in the NSA before the internet was public. And he worked for them as, I think, a third party contractor on ARPANET, which ARPANET, if anybody isn't aware, is the actual original internet before the capital I internet that we, we know today, right? Um, and ARPANET actually started with, I think it was five bit messages in 32, it was 32 nodes. It was crazy. I still have an old ARPANET map. That's just fun. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, to have learned from somebody who was literally, you know, there in the birth of, of the internet. And he, he went on to become the first fellow for Cisco, um, a fellow being kind of your top tech. Um, like the highest that's just in Silicon Valley fellow is the highest uh, technical position you can get to. Like, I think IBM has five fellows. I mean, it, the, it, the picking is slim uh, to get, you know, to the level of being a fellow. Um, he was the first fellow for Cisco. So, I mean, he built Cisco, basically. And Dino basically built Cisco. Yeah. And so it was just, you know, gratitude to you, Dino, like, you know, keep on like I love I love about Dino how he just is so enthusiastic that was my favorite thing about him he just loved to learn and loved to play with all these gadgets and we always just, just had so much fun together and that's it's just so rewarding to meet people like that that just love to do what they do and they're good at it too so you know before that tangent just want to say props and thanks to Dino but RTR that's why I went on the Dino tangent reverse tunneling router that is uh it's a terminology from Lisp, and it's essentially a way that you traverse network address translators. So um, I'm doing it, you know, utilizing TCP hole punching to punch a hole through the network address translator so you can get bidirectional traffic, including actually opening up or, you know, probing to create a connection to the other individual. Generally, you can't with NATs, and that's the biggest uh, Achilles heel of all peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, nobody's 
network routers are open or, you know, only get one port open and it's, or whatever you have may be unreliable or so on and so forth. So this, this really, really helps with establishing incoming connections and it sets the stage for our peer-to-peer -peer messenger and our remote login system. And we can use it for many, many other things. It's essentially just a reverse tunneling router. So it's a reverse router, which means um, you connect to it from the inside of the network, right? Um, and then someone else connects to the other side of it, and then that's how you create that connection between you two, where you could both be behind NATs. So um, last where we left off, I had been dabbling with some of the handshake stuff. I got that all done. It's running. It's just to recap, it's fully decentralized root of trust. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, um, if you've run a website or you've seen a website, hey, this website's unsafe, the security certificate, is blah, 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 you know, everybody's seen that probably at some point. And if you've ever run a website, you know you have to go buy an SSL certificate. Okay. The reason you have to do that is cryptography does not give you the ability to identify someone individually. It only gives you a mathematical relationship between a couple pieces of data, your public key, your signature, and your private key. That's all it does. Um, the public key doesn't really mean anything unless it's tied to something, right? Anyone can give anyone a public key. So just simply going through a key exchange does not indicate that you're actually a secure channel because what could very well be happening is somebody could be sitting on your network and doing some art poisoning and forwarding all of your packets through them and essentially performing the handshake to you and pretending that they're the site you're trying to talk to while they're making the handshake to the, the remote site and then just passing traffic to you and decrypting it all so they can see all of your passwords and everything, right? That's called a man in the middle of attack. And SSL, Secure Socket Layer, and TLS, Transport Layer Security, were essentially implemented in the session layer of the OSI in order to protect against man-in-the-middle attacks. But the act of encryption is not enough. You need to identify the encryption. Um, so there's things called public key databases where you upload your public keys to this database and then you can say, okay, I'm registered as Viz on this public key database and now if you want to talk to Viz, you're going to check that public key database and make sure the public key that the person that's claiming to be Viz is the same, right? And that's going to make you, that gives you the ability to identify someone now, right? When you have it tied to something. So instead of a public key database, which is centralized, we have a crypto object register, which is happens when you create, everyone creates an account. And that just holds a bunch of hashes, just, just, just a bunch of 256-bit hashes. Um, one of the hashes is named the certificate. So what you do when you do that handshake, which we're using Kyber, but usually, you know, uh, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman is generally what everybody uses or some sort of RSA variant. But when you engage in a handshake, you're exchanging public keys. And what it does is it hashes that public key and then it checks that to your certificate hash in your crypto object register. And that ensures without a shadow of a doubt that the person you are intending to talk to is the person that you're talking to. And it does not require a certificate authority. Um, if anybody saw the BGP hijacking attacks on, I think it was my Ether wallet, um, that's a really good example of a flaw of the internet is somebody just broadcasted on Bordergate protocol that they owned a block of IP addresses and a lot of people believed them because there's no authentication. Right? You can say anything on the internet and it's generally believed, right? It's kind of interesting that the reflection how like, people do say anything on the internet without it being authenticated. I'm talking about like keyboard warriors. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other tangent. But Borgate protocol doesn't really authenticate. So, you know, these people basically took over a block of IP addresses on the internet and then found a security a certificate authority to issue them a certificate <laughs> They managed to pull that off, and then they now control the domain of my Ether wallet. And so they naturally just put a backdoored version of my Ether wallet on, and then anybody that logged into it, you know, got their credentials compromised, and then they went to the real my Ether wallet. I think that what that hack was, I think, fifty million or something like that. Um, issue with the internet architecturally, nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can do about that, right? Like, if you have an IP address, that can happen. Your IP address can just get totally taken away from you. 
um, because you don't actually really prove that you own it. It's just there's this very loose relationship between all the ISPs and big router manufacturers that generally know who owns what, and that's kind of the way they authenticate it more than like they're actually being cryptographic proofs, right? So um, that's just a really good example of how you can have you know, severe security issues come from just like an architectural limitation on the internet, right? Border gate protocol can be totally hijacked. So um, this is why this whole reverse tunneling router authentication with a crypto object register was so powerful because that security certificate that was issued on hijacked IPs was what enabled really a big part of them to, to, to drain all the ether out of my ether wallet. And the biggest flaw in any security system, if anybody's not aware, if you've ever worked in security, like uh, I'll just give you a story because this will just help express it better. A guy at DEF CON goes up and says, I'm going to, I'm going to do a SIM swap. SIM swapping is the biggest issue in the world. Today, I'm going to execute a SIM swap. Watch and learn. He picks up his phone and he dials customer service. Five minutes later, he's got your phone number. All you got to do is know the right things to say because people are the biggest security vulnerability, right? It's just people are the security flaw, okay? It doesn't matter if you're using 512-bit encryption, okay? If somebody gives you the key because they think you're the janitor, then <laughs> the whole building's compromised. So um, the best thing I've learned to cope with that is to not give people that opportunity to make that mistake, right? And it's just common. It's fun. We're, we're trusting, loving people. It's okay. We're, we're, all, we're all a part of the same thing, and there's a deep subconscious drive for us to connect and learn and love each other, and that's why we always feel like we're dumb when we get screwed over, right? But that don't, don't ever get down on yourself for that because it's, it's, it's our nature. It's, you know, the, the cells in your body don't want to be isolated from one another. They want to function together to make the body work, okay? We're, we're not too different from that but <clears throat> anyway so you essentially have this, this security problem with humans right the security certificate authority issued this security certificate without actually doing the proper due diligences or enough and they got fooled and then you know people lost 50 to 100 million dollars um, this doesn't have that problem you don't have a security certificate you don't have an authority that you have to communicate with. You don't have any of those things. You just have you and the person you're attempting to communicate with. And you exchange public keys and you check each other's crypto object registers because you have a point of contact by each other's Genesis IDs or usernames. So you know who you're trying to talk to, whether that be a socket connection or a message or um, any of that. And so you get their public key and you can verify without a shadow of doubt that that is the person. And then, then you, do the, you do the key exchange make sure that's good, and then you do another signed message on top of that using Falcon, um, where you actually sign a message with a timestamp, and then that, that timestamp expires in like 10 seconds, so if the message even takes too long to get to you, it's going to be stale, right? Because somebody could just be floating around and picking up those messages and trying to use those, even though they can't create those signatures, they can still try to snatch that and replay it. It's called a replay attack. So um, it's got all of those, those standard security measures built into the protocol. Um, and it's really cool because it's a really nice blend of all these different cryptographies, right? To really create this really nice, smooth, um, you know, reverse tunneling router. And this, this technology here can be used beyond just this RTR server. Um, it's just the beginning, really, and it's really to show kind of some of the value of it. But decentralized root of trust is really powerful um, because certificate authorities are just they're a problem, and it, you, we see it with the Borgate protocol hijacking attacks. So, um, yeah, a little spiel on that, which it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Like the, my whole journey through the world of Internet security and stuff, it really has been. I mean, I, I would be lying if when I, when I started Nexus a long time ago if I had um, any idea of, like, what it would really materialize into. I mean... <laughs> I didn't start this project saying, yeah, well, we're going to rebuild the whole internet. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a lofty goal, but I mean, the further along the project got, the more I became knowledgeable of not just the issues of the internet, but also like our capabilities and then seeing the technology materialize more and more and continually reinforce those capabilities. It's become even clearer and clearer and finding all these missing pieces like the ISM and finishing the Nexus Protocol white paper. I mean, it's been a feat. It really has. 
um, not just to to believe and see that being possible. You know how how in God's name does David take down Goliath, right? Um, that's that's the first hurdle is just overcoming yourself, right? And like, is this possible? Um, but getting the architecture developed on top of that, like it really it really has been a pleasure to do. And as I said, just for any of the naysayers out there too, like you know, I mean, it, we didn't start Nexus with this this big this big grandiose vision. It really just started as a pretty humble vision with CoinShield and just trying to clean up some of the scams in the industry and making some good tech. And it really, it's really grown into what it is now. And, and you know, to me that gives merit to to the idea. Is it? It's something that's grown gradually through more people becoming involved in the community and feedback and learning from other people. You know, um, Dino was a really big part of all of that and teaching me and really, you know, helping me understand. And Victor as well. Victor helped a lot with the, the routing system. He was actually the first person I called when I designed it. Like, Victor, I don't think we even need IP addresses. And he was like, what? Yeah, we don't need IP addresses. It's like, how, how does that work? Like, how, how do you have an internet without IP addresses? And Victor's a, he's a brilliant Cisco fellow, I think, too. Um, I think he's at Google now, though. Uh, but, you know, shout out to Victor, too. Like, he's, He's a great person, like not just like a, a good person, but like he's he's brilliant too. Um, but so yeah, and how do you do that call? I mean, he's, he's build no IP addresses. So I was like, well, the IP address itself is is acting as a locator and an identifier, right? That's Lisp locator identifier separation protocol. He's like, yeah, exactly. I'm like, but really, the locator. Right, your routing table is just a decision tree, right, through your routes. And he's like, yes. And I'm like, really, ideally, what you're doing is you're just mapping a machine readable value to some sort of GPS coordinate, are you not? And he's like, yeah, I mean, pretty much that's what it is. Each IP address has its own geolocation. And that's how the routing system knows how to get that packet to you, is it, it jumps from hop to hop and it follows the decision tree to know, okay, you know, is this number to the left or to the right? <laughs> You know, do I go right? Do I go left? And it, it slowly goes through, right? Well, that quickly goes through, I should say. And I was like, okay, well, you know, if if that's acting as the locator, why do we need to store that state? You already have the state of your location, wherever you are. And he's like, what are you saying? I'm, just, I'm saying, what if you could have a router where we still use list, where you have an identifier, but your locator is GPS coordinates, not IP address, because that's an easily retrievable information. You can get it anywhere you are, and you don't have to store it on a server or in a router. You don't have to change it. You don't have to upload it into a new router. You don't have to bind it to a port, right? Like it works with the MAC address bound to the, you know, to the to the IP address and so on and so forth. And he just was like, dude, like, I, I never thought of it like that, but like, you're right. I think he's like, here, do, do, let me go. Let me go see if I can find anything out there like that. Anybody that's ever talked about this. I'll give you a call back. He goes, okay. You know, like 20 minutes later, he calls me back. He's like, bro, check your email. I found a paper on it. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you're onto some shit. And I was like, whoa, wait, no, really? And he's like, yeah, dude. Uh, it just, it all became so clear with that, like that moment where it's just, Wow, like we don't, you don't need to manage all of that state. I mean, can you imagine how much state you'd have to manage when you have billions of devices constantly moving and each one has to have their own IP address that correlates to a specific location from a router from a hardcore port? No, it's, it's, you'd spend all your cycles just maintaining your IP addresses and locations than to actually even routing packets, right? This, you don't have that problem at all. You don't have to go constantly upload your IP address into a new place or get a new IP address when you go to a new place. You just broadcast your GPS coordinates to your local ground station and make a signature using the post-quantum Kyber handshake crypto object register stuff that I was just talking about to authenticate your identifier, which means now nobody can pretend to be your identifier. And you register those GPS coordinates that gets uploaded into the satellites as a bloom filter so when somebody sources a packet to your identifier, that identifier is going to trip the bloom filter, and that's going to trigger a downlink, which is going to say, ah, is there any state down on this ground station? The ground station is going to say, yes, I'm actually servicing this identifier. I won't tell you where they are, but I'll take your packets. 
ground station takes the packets. Then they reach out to you. Hey, I got some packets for you. Then you decide, do I want these packets or not? Do I know this person? Uh, I'm going to pass on that. Or sure, I'll take the packets. If you pass on it, you just simply send a knack back and you just point your antenna somewhere else. And this is really a powerful part of this. If anybody's familiar with distributed denial of service attacks, where you can overload someone's router with traffic, um, melt the routers, literally melting the hardware, because memory is only so fast. And a packet is stored in memory. Right? So anytime you're, uh, <laughs> you get lots of packets, that's, that's going to be consuming memory clock cycles. And if you only have so many clock cycles, then you can only process so many packets. And so even if it's bad traffic and you're just dropping the packet, just even the dropping of the packet itself is too energy consumptive and your router is rendered useless. Right? And the problem with this, the reason it's this way, is because it's an open pipe. Anyone can send anything down that open pipe, and there's nothing stopping it except for you dropping the packet at your router. With this, on the signal layer, you just cut, you cut the line, you cut the cord, you cut the pipe, because you're not actually directly connected by wire. You create a hard wire switch off by just pointing your face ray antenna to another location, right? And then, then you're not actually, the worst they can do is try to bombard you with radio frequency interference. But if you have really high directional gain, it, it helps with that. So you, you solve all of these multitudes of issues in one thing, right? But the biggest issue is the economic issue of the internet. The internet is really only used by about 2 billion people on the planet because there's economic disparity and you know not every country has power or the infrastructure in order to actually develop or even deploy internet infrastructure. But <laughs> that does not mean that these people are not valuable. They're just held in economic disparity. So when you start opening the internet economic model to where it turns from me having to pay for it to me earning from it, people can invest together and buying a ground station to provide Wi-Fi to their little town, or somebody can invest themselves to sell to their friend, and then everybody becomes an ISP around the world. And everybody becomes a content delivery network. Everybody becomes a router. And everybody gets a slice of that, right? And due to Metcalfe's law, the value of a telecommunication system multiplies exponentially with the square of the participants, right? In other words, two of the power of four, four of the power of 16, you know, so on and so forth. Um, Values multiplied exponentially in telecommunication systems. So now imagine that exponential value, but going back to us, right? It changes everything, and it really is the ultimate game over for, for all of everything, right? Because a lot of this technocracy, they're building it up around the Internet, right? Um, if we ever get to a point where there's issues with Internet and Starlink's the only thing you get access to, well, that's really easy to cut off your Starlink terminal now, isn't it? Um, and if you've seen some of the discussions of, you know, scores, scoring on citizenry's, you know, perfection to their compliance and subservience to certain figures that may name themselves governments, um, I'm speaking in eloquent words, not trip off the, uh, you know, the neural nets. But anyway, you know, if, if, if you have any of those, you know, disagreements per se, like, and that score happens to go down, then now you, you don't have internet, or you, know, you don't have the access to this site, or you know, when you control that, you control information. When you control information, you really control people's minds. And I've spoken about this before, but the, I was really fascinated once about um, why do the Dark Ages form? Like, what, what was the fundamental reason the Dark Ages existed? There are some like mini Ice Age and stuff, but that's just famine. The darkness, the brutal darkness, how did that happen? Roads, so simple. The Roman Empire, when it collapsed, the roads went out of service and between cities became unsafe. So naturally, it was not safe to travel, and so information didn't travel. And it got, became siloed and isolated and stuck, and thus you had darkness. So in one way of seeing it, you could see information as light, right? Just like the light comes from the sun, bounces off, and reflects back the information of the object you're observing, and thus you see it, right? So in order to, to bring that forward, right, to, to bring the possibility for us to live a more enlightened future, like we need information.
to travel freely between us. But not just travel now, right? Like, because viruses travel freely too. You need the information also to be sanitized and clarified. You need to know what the source of something is. You need to know where it came from, when it came from. And you need to see all of the peer review along that pathway, right? We naturally have a, a, an awareness together. When you get enough people together, you, you can literally, quite literally solve any leg. I mean, take a jar of jelly beans. I've said this analogy a lot, but for those that haven't heard it, if you take a jar of jelly beans and 100 people and you get everybody to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar and you average their guess, just average their guesses, it's within uh, 2 or 3% accuracy. So in the same sense, we all see things. So if there was better ways for that to be reflected in the informational cryptographic system in a form of reputation for information, then this information can no longer be corrupted, destroyed, or manipulated because enough people have the capability to check and balance it, right? And then you have authentication as far as the human informational aspect, right? And you have authentication on every level of the stack, I'm talking the fundamental lower level authentication I was talking about earlier, crypto object register, kyber handshakes, all of that stuff. But now on the higher level, when you're like trying to understand something and you don't know who to trust, right? Instead of there being some authority to say, ah, you must trust this specific news outlet or this one, um, you can just go look and say, oh, okay, I'm going to search and I'm going to verify and I'm going to see. Ah, you know, this came from here and it has this root and it had, you know, so-and-so reviews. It's been around for this long, gone through this much analysis compared to this. I think I'm going to go with the first one. And that also can then be tied into search rankings, right? So you, you create a really robust, this, what's really cool about good architecture, you know, you got good architecture when, when one thing mutually benefits other things where you design a component for a specific purpose but then that component ends up providing purpose to other components inadvertently this is like that right it's really powerful you get search you get information you get the ability to host without having any you know ability for it to be censored you get decentralized indexing you get reputation you get clarity of getting to the source you clear online rumors you create authentication on the network stack i mean this is the list i could keep going and going so yeah i, I feel i could give you guys a little a little nip of that philosophies and some of those things so you can just kind of understand what the thinking is on that um, yeah felt it was necessary um next step next thing um I've been talking about getting my laboratory set up. It's up. It's done. Finally, I'm actually in it right now. It's been wonderful. So I've got quite a few 633 megahertz transceivers and Arduinos. I have a 2.4 gigahertz quadrature amplitude modulator, but I'm going to play with that later. But essentially, I've got the tools to build some basic peer-to-peer -peer communication devices. So. I'm starting the software-defined router development on Arduinos. I figured it makes the most sense to develop it as since it's a mobile-moving physical routing system. It doesn't make sense to just virtualize that on a computer and try to pretend that I, I can simulate it. So <laughs> I'm building the actual physical device so I don't have to pretend that I know because I don't know. I don't know all of, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. And so if you virtualize something you may not be getting all of the things correct. So this will actually, they each have a GPS antenna. So I've got uh, Arduino GPS antenna, 633 megahertz transceivers, a couple other things, um, some hydrogen fuel cells too, but we will go into the fuel cell stuff at a later time. Um, and I will be also posting demonstration videos too as well um, as different technologies become more mature than others, um, such as... I will be showing some of the hydrogen technology at some point in the future. I will be showing some of the uh, the new electrical propulsion experiments. Once I get something airborne, I will also be showing demonstrations of the Arduino software-defined router. So that'll be really cool to see that material. It's essentially, it's going to be a little mini computer with a battery and just get two people and go walk around and, you know, test the GPS registration, essentially going to have an Arduino that's the, the server, the main server, um, that's the ground station, and then I'll need to have a couple clients walking around, and then they'll have to basically automatically synchronize and find the ground station, connect, 
um, submit the mapping entries, handle all that basic authentication, um, and then be able to send and receive packets. And then that, the plan is anyway that the Arduino software defined router is going to be just that, a router. It's going to only really be responsible for packet forwarding, messaging, uh, basically a packet and cap, decap, just basic router stuff. They're not going to be too beefed up, but they're going to connect to a computer as a secondary device. So it should, that's the design. Anyway, it's just connected in as a USB device so that you can actually use it um, from your computer and source and send packets through it. So in the very early stages of the Nexus protocol, we'll, we'll have things like that. And once I get that done, that software-defined router, basic demo like that, plug it in your computer, you have a nice little software-defined routing system so you can form your own local mesh networks. I'm going to open source that, obviously, the Arduino source code and the wiring diagrams and all that. Same with the hydrogen. Um, I will be publishing all of my wiring diagrams there's a very specific conditioning process that you'll have to learn. Um, conditioning meaning building up a catalyst. It's a, it's a type of white powder. It's really kind of fascinating, actually. I've had a spectrum analysis done on it, and it, it was not what I thought it was. But <laughs> that's another story. But yeah, so I'll, I'll publish all of that in, in, in clear detail, because um, my goal of initiating all of these experiments is not to be the person to be given credit for all of these things, but I want to inspire you guys to start doing your own tinkering experiments too and building on this research and working on developing an open source technological database. I'm focusing mainly on, like I said, propulsion, communication, and energy. Those are the three things my primary focuses are on, and I'll always be pumping out open source code, which is like open source hardware, software, all of that. But don't let my drive uh, limit yours, right? If there's things that make you passionate, you're excited, you're curious about any of these things, um, feel free to just tag me on Twitter. If you have a question or you want me to explain anything, I'm, I'm happy to answer um, minimally. You'll, you'll catch me on Twitter, but that's all you'll catch me on social media anymore because uh, it's really nice to be able to just put away if I don't want it. So I may not respond, but it, don't, don't let that stop you. <laughs> to say um, if you're really inspired and you are curious about some of these things definitely ask because I can help you get set up so you can start uh, developing your own experiments as well um, really important really important for this that specifically to be decentralized uh, as much as possible so as many people working on this as possible the safer it becomes for all of us so yeah that's the hardware side of the development recap it's been really nice I'm, I'm in my I'm in my zen in my Zen mode. I'm surrounded by fuel cells and circuits, and microcontrollers, and coils, and I got, I got my computer, my coffee. Again, I'm happy. I'm really happy. And I'm really happy everything's pretty well wrapping up, too. Uh, that we have, yeah, so recap. Monday, new mobile wallet is going to go public for the next beta version, fixing uh, all of the bugs that were reported in this last cycle. Um, don't expect any UI enhancements. This is bug fixes, but we are open for suggestions for enhancements, so please don't hold back, but we may not take your suggestions. Just be prepared for that, too, but don't let that stop you from making them. So desktop wallet, around the same time. That'll be a beta. It should be pretty well stable, I should say, but we might have to go through a couple beta cycles with that and enhancement cycles, all of that. So that's the new 5.1 desktop wallet running all of the new 5.1 features. Um, so, I mean, one noticeable effect you'll see is anybody that has a larger sig chain, you notice when you open up the transactions tab, it can take a minute. That's, that's one symptom of the API, because that's just doing users list transactions, and that command itself <laughs> could take five minutes for a big sig chain. And that's what I mean when I say exponential time algorithms. Um, yeah, and that's okay. I mean, that just that happens when early development and stuff like that. So, you know, don't don't take my my criticism of people thinking that I think they're bad coders or anything. I mean, like Paul Paul did the best he could. Like I'm I'm really grateful for the time that he spent with it. But I'm also just really persnickety in my code, and I, I recognize that can be probably hard to work with. 
But you guys love me for that because you know you get good co. And that's really where I just won't compromise is it has to be really good co. Period. And, you know, I'm seeing that materializing now. Um, I'm not going to introduce you this time. You didn't want to do it this time, Kizan. But Kizan wants to give some updates. He's been working on the API. Not API, sorry. He's just doing testing stuff right now. So there's a unit testing framework. So I kind of kicked him off in learning the unit test so he can just start to basically learn our data structures. He made some really beautiful UML, um, unified modeling language, to kind of visualize all of the work and... Um, I'm sure he'll give comment on that the next uh, weekly recap. I think that's what we'll call it. Again, suggestions. There's, uh, you, if you notice, the names change every, <laughs> every time. Development update with Colin Control. AMA with Colin Control. Next is development update. So, I mean, it's the, the name will settle. I'm kind of liking Nexus weekly recap. I kind of like that. I think that uh, that feels right. But if you guys have suggestions, obviously say them. But yeah, he'll he'll be given more of an update next week. He's just kind of getting kicking, um, but he's 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 really been just spending a lot. He's really enthusiastic about it. So it's it's cool to have him on board. We'll see how uh, everything unfolds from here. But that's really cool. So you you guys will probably meet him in the next week or two. He's kind of eager. He's just balancing lots of other stuff. So I don't think he he felt like he got enough done to really want to like talk about. It. So he'll probably next week. Um, but I mean, what I saw from the call, it looked really good. It's, he's just paying very close attention to all these little details, which is really important. Um, I mean, you think the devils are in the details. You should see the devil in the details in code, man. I mean, one missing semicolon, everything blows up or missing zero. Like, that's happened. <laughs> if anybody remembers, don't miss a zero. But anyway, so. We covered all of the ground. I think we got a recap, new betas on Monday. I'm just about, I'd say I probably got, if I don't have too much bug fixing to do this week, I think I'll probably be wrapped up with 5152 stuff um, within the next week or two, like wrapped, um, as far as like the new feature build out that we needed. Ideally, I'm shooting to be done by next recap, but um, things can happen. And you obviously have the debugging phase, so I'm kind of timing that with the mobile stuff. I've, I've really had to spend a lot more time on the mobile the last couple weeks uh, than I'd wanted to. So I've been happy to get back into the 5152 stuff. But um, you know, as always, you know, no expectations, no disappointment. So don't take these 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 take the Monday. That's 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 hard. We're doing that. That's happening. Um, but as far as like the, the estimation of how long it's going to take to wrap up the rest of 5152, uh, I just don't take that too literally. But that's what we're kind of shooting for. So, yep, new betas on Monday. Um, labs go in. I'll post pictures of inventions as prototypes as they uh, materialize more. I'll post schematics for anything that I, I show. I will give the open source designs. So all of you can follow that, replicate it, criticize it, peer review, whatever scientific method, you know what to do. Um, Code-wise, everything's going really well. Um, chugging away, got all of the really complicated stuff done, working on just a couple little relay messages, and then I get to pipe it all in and run it. I have not run the relay server yet. It's been in just build out. That takes so much discipline, too. Right? You just want to play with it. But it's almost there. So I'm pretty close to firing it up. I'd probably say a few days away from firing up the relay server. And then that's just my own internal debugging. And then just pretty much like inherit some templates from the API. And that's pretty much a wrap. So it's really not that far out. Um, but I'm just working on being conservative with my estimations of myself since I am so timeless. I'm just not always good at estimating. So I'm trying to double what I think. We'll see how well that works. But anyhow, thank you for tuning in, everybody. It's been a good week. I, uh, again, if you have any suggestions, if you think there's a better day to do it, please post in the comments what your uh, suggested day would be. I kind of like Friday just to have a full week, and it's a nice like to recap, but I recognize that people have things going on on Friday too. So 
if you like listening to them live and you want them on Thursday or anything, just just shoot sure a comment and um, expect the new desktop and mobile alt betas on Monday. Um, I don't think they're going to be exactly at the same time, but that's all wrapped. It's all running. Um, yeah, so we just pretty much have to make builds for that, and the the new new mobile wallet I think is pretty close to that too. And then, as always, um, do not ever send me direct messages with bugs. Please post it as an issue on an issue tracker. If there's anything that needs to be modified in the source code, if you're changing seed node do domains or anything, post it as an issue. Okay, that's where I track everything. So don't send me direct messages with bugs. Okay, I will not respond to them. I will not see them. I will not answer them. I'm being very firm on that right now. Just like I'm not, just, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm focusing on code. I'll be on Twitter if you want to talk to me here and there. Um, otherwise, I'm just, I'm just building stuff. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm making myself a little bit less available, but for the right reasons, because it's just we need to get all this stuff done. And I get so much more done when I don't have to answer messages all day. So just keep that in mind. If you have bugs, issues tracker, um, if you need anything, if they're really, really important issues, I mean, you can like, you can still message me, but I'm, I may not respond or, you know, especially if it's, if it's kind of a little more something that I feel like you could have figured on yourself, like it's, I'm definitely not going to respond. So, but, you know, if they're important things, just bring them to my attention or, you know, bring it to uh, someone else, like, I guess you can ping Phil and he can get in touch with me or something. Um, so, yeah, but I want to also say, you know, good job, guys. There's a community. You guys have been doing awesome and keeping the community together, like, rocking and rolling it without me. Like, this is, this, it was a big step to have to do, like, to just, like, you know, it's it's in your guys' hands. I'm still here to always support you. I'm here to always code and finish this and see this through. But Nexus to grow up needs to rely on you guys, right? You guys. And so I just wanted to say thank you guys for doing a really good job. I've been. It looks like everything's been doing good. I haven't been in the Telegram, but the sentiment seems really good. It seems like what you guys are doing, you're doing right. I looked at the website the other day, and the arms are all growing. It's just really cool to see. Oh, it's really so. Keep up the good work, guys. Like, and thank you to everybody that's contributing. Thank you to everybody that's put your time in. Um, thank you everybody for being here with us too. And you know, yeah, I just appreciate you guys, and I will keep you guys updated as more things progress. I will plan on the same time next Friday, one o'clock. Maybe push it back a little bit. But it's a pretty reasonable time so until next time everybody we shall <laughs>